Wait, is that flat? That's flat, isn't it? Oh, poop knuckles. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is part two of the knurling tool build, and this section includes what I think is the coolest part on this entire project. So let's go. Here's where we left off here. We've got the rough structure of a Terminator claw, but it needs a lot of pins and things to join it all together. The first part up today is actually a really interesting one. It's got a lot of complex features, and I think you'll be surprised where we land considering where we're starting here. So I'm going to start with this piece of 1215 steel. It's a free machining steel that comes in the kit. After facing the front, as is tradition, I'm going to touch the tool lightly on the surface here and then put an indicator on my carriage. If you have a DRO, you don't have to do all this, of course. And then I zero the indicator, translate the carriage over to the exact depth I want for my shoulder, and then reset the indicator so that it's at zero at this final position with a little bit of preload so that I get some warning as the tool approaches that zero. And then I can power feed a series of passes here, and I'm stopping just short of the zero on each pass, about two thousandths on each pass. This is an easy method for getting very accurate shoulders both in length and diameter. Once I'm within finishing cut range here, verified with the micrometer, then I do my finishing cut and I go all the way to zero this time on the indicator and then feed out on the cross slide. Each of those passes that we did on the rough cutting left a little bit of a sawtooth pattern on the shoulder there because of the angles of the tool clearances. So going all the way into zero and then pulling out does a tooth out cut on that shoulder, which brings it to dimension and smooths up the surface. That's an easy shoulder cutting method that I've shown many times, but most people don't watch every video, so I like to cover stuff again once in a while. And if I did my job right, this should be a really nice fit in this half circle here in the arms. And that's looking good. I'm going to part this off to length now, which I do by lining up the edge of the parting blade on the end of the part. What I'm doing here is sweeping the scale back and forth across where the top edge of the parting blade will be and moving the parting blade towards the scale slowly. And you can feel when the scale just starts touching that parting blade. That's a pretty accurate method for setting the parting blade on the end of the part, and then I can use an indicator to translate down to where I want the part to be. I'm going to part this off and flip it around to do the other shoulder. I'm opting to do this in two setups rather than a single one because doing it all in one setup would require a lot more stick out, and then I'd need to put a center in the part for tail support, and that wouldn't look good here. So that's why I'm doing it in two setups. And if you're thinking that Yahtzee looked awfully close to the chuck, well, you are not wrong. But clearance is clearance, friends, and trust me, I was watching the edge of that tool holder like a hawk. I was crazy like a fox. A hawk fox. I was watching like a crazy hawk fox. Look, there's an animal metaphor in there somewhere, okay? That remaining stub there is going to be the other of these two parts, so we'll see that again later. And I'm going to switch out to a collet sized for the shoulder that we turned, and I'm going to hold it on this shoulder. My thought was this would make it easier to get the center boss area the right length, but actually in hindsight I don't think it did, so probably wasn't much help. So I face that end off to get a good surface, and then I measure the total length, and that tells me how deep to make the shoulder. The shoulders have a fair amount of tolerance on them, but the center area needs to be quite accurate. So if I need to cheat the shoulder a little bit shorter or longer in order to hit the accurate dimension on the center area, then I can do that now. It always pays to think about which dimensions are the most critical in your order of operations, because when dimensions are interdependent like this, you can usually fudge the less critical one in order to hit the critical one. There's the first part. Now I needed to bring the second one to the same point, but again, that remaining piece of stock was very short, so I had to alter my approach here. One of the challenges with these kits is that they always give you, eh, let's say, less material than you would like for these setups. So your order of operations might have to adapt to having very little material to hold on to. In this case, I ended up holding the part by the center area and then facing it off and pulling it out and measuring it and so on. over to the mill now with these two parts. They both need a threaded hole right through the center of them. 
So I've got one of my favorite fixtures here. This is my cross drilling fixture, which you've seen lots. I do have a video on making this fixture if you're interested. Luckily the part is sticking out just enough past the large black strap on the fixture there that I can use the wide part of the edge finder to pick up the end of it there. I can do that on both sides to get centered up on the X axis. And then for the Y axis, I center up on the fixture itself. The way this fixture works is that that V groove has been machined very, very accurately to be exactly in the center of the fixture, intentionally so that you can edge find on the fixture itself and not have to try and find a way to edge find on the round part there in the middle, which is frequently not accessible, as is the case here. So now all centered up, I can center drill first because we're of course drilling into a convex surface and the drill would tend to wander off. So a center drill first prevents that. And I can drill straight through with the tapping drill size for the thread that we need here. And of course this fixture has a hole in the bottom so we can drill straight through and we're not gonna hit the fixture. Well, I suppose if it didn't have a hole in the bottom, it does now. And then using the same setup, I can tap that hole. Now one of these parts gets a tapped hole and one of them gets a clearance hole. However, I'm putting tapped holes in both. And the reason for that is really neat. You'll see why here in a moment. There's the tapped hole there. The edge of a thread always looks crazy when it breaks through a convex surface like that. It's always interesting. Now over to the lathe again, I've got a little stub from the scrap bin and I'm gonna turn up a little threaded mandrel. Now this is a setup and an order of operations that's given to me by the build notes on this drawing. And I'm glad because it's very, very clever and I don't think I would have thought of it. So I'm turning up a threaded shoulder here with an undercut to make sure that things that thread on here are gonna seat tightly against that shoulder. And then I cut a thread on here and this is the same thread as we just tapped into those parts. So I think you see where this is going. Now I can thread this part onto the mandrel there and we can face it in half. You'll see why in a moment here, but what's important about this mandrel is that that shoulder is square and that undercut that I did on the thread is key because threads are not good locating instruments. They have a lot of tolerance in them, otherwise they wouldn't work as threads. You wouldn't be able to twist them together. So that shoulder is what's ensuring that the facing cut that I'm doing now is gonna be square to the rest of the features on the part. That shoulder is forcing the thread into alignment effectively when you tighten the part down. Now why on earth am I facing this part? Well, we're actually creating two half circular parts to go in those half circle features that are in the arms on the knurling tool. Since nobody has yet invented the elusive zero thickness slitting saw, we have to make two of these parts and basically waste half of each one in order to get the shape that we need. This is the reality of subtractive manufacturing. And the mandrel gives me enough clearance here that I can measure the overall thickness here with a micrometer so that I know when I've reached the halfway point. After all of that facing, this part is quite tight on there, as you might expect, because of course the machining forces act upwards on the front of the part, acting to tighten it further and further on the mandrel as we go. So it took a little bit of assistance there, but we can remove that part now and put the next one on and do the same thing. I really love parts like this in machining because you wouldn't know from where we started that this was where we were gonna end up. And I like parts where to glance at them, you might wonder how on earth that could have possibly been made with such basic tools. And this is definitely one of those parts. Back over to the mill now, I've got a couple more features to do. I'm using a gauge pin that's a close fit for the minor diameter of the threads there. I put that in the spindle and I use that to center up on the drill hole there. Remember that both parts were tapped for threads, but actually only one of them is supposed to have threads. We just needed to do that so that they could both be mounted on that mandrel. And now I can just come in with a clearance drill for this size of bolt and drill out the threads on one of them. Again, that approach was not my idea. It was given to me by the drawings and I'm glad because that's really clever and I would not have thought of it. Now, this is interesting. Look at the drawing here. I almost missed that I need one additional surface here. There's a little flat spot here that's only visible in a single projection. And it's very easy to miss and I almost did. And well, that's why we have multiple projections on drawings because sometimes a given surface is only visible in one of them. This is why you really want to spend quality time with a drawing and make sure that you really understand the shape of this final part. 
So in the same setup now, I can bring in an end mill and flatten down that surface. If I'd noticed that sooner, it would have been easier to do this before I did the drilling and tapping, and that would have made a more secure grip on the mandrel as well. So I'm sure that was the intention that you create this flat surface first, but like I said, I just didn't notice it until now. But in a rare moment of serendipity on small machine tools, the micrometer actually fits in there without having to disturb the setup. That's really rare, and it's very nice to be able to measure something without messing up the setup. There's the two parts there, both very interesting, one clearance drilled, one threaded. You might be wondering, what the heck are these for? They're very interesting parts. I think probably the most interesting parts on this entire project. Well, what these do is they sit in those half circle grooves there on the arms, and they act as basically swiveling clamping surfaces for the big threaded rod that goes through to provide the clamping for the neural wheels. Because of course, neural arms operate at all different angles and you want the clamping force to always be straight across them. So that's a very clever little design here. And then those flat surfaces that we made on the bottom are a bearing surface for bushings that hold the end of the spring captive. This will all make sense in the end. The next parts I need are some pins that separate those two arms. The kit provides more of this nice 1215 free machining steel for this. 1215, if you're wondering, is a free machining alloy of steel similar to 12L14, which you see me use a lot, but it does not have lead in it. So it's a, a really nice alternative to traditional free machining steel that I'm going to start using. I'm going to start buying this stuff once I use up all of my 12L14. These parts are very simple, just a basic shoulder turning operation, very similar to what we just did. If I did my job right, those pins should slide into the arms nicely like that. And that looks really good right there. I'm also going to just very lightly skim the OD of this part just to make them look nice. Just shaving off as little as I can to clean them up. This dimension isn't critical. The large area here is just floating in space, unlike on those previous parts. Then these get center drilled, tap drilled, and tapped for threads because there's little button head screws that go in here to hold the knurling arms together. So I'll go ahead and tap that. Now the only interesting detail here is that you want to make sure that the button head bolts can tighten all the way down flush against the ends of these pins, which for commercial bolts is often tricky because they don't undercut the threads at the top of them and there might be a chamfer or you know half of a thread at the top of the bolt, something like that. So to compensate for that, I can put a generous chamfer in here, and that'll give clearance for whatever manufacturing disaster is right under the top surface of the bolt head. This part is very similar to the start of the previous one, but I'll show you a different way that you can do that. I've got more stick out here, and I'm going to translate over with the grooving tool instead of the parting blade at this point, and I'm going to do the other shoulder all in one setup. This method works great if the stock is long enough to where you can have this much stick out, and if the stock is free cutting enough that you don't need tail support in here because clearance can be an issue or you may not want to center in the end of the part. And this method is great if concentricity is really crucial for the part. If you need all of these features to be very concentric, then there's no better way to achieve that than doing them all in one setup. So what I do here is I do a series of grooving operations stopping just short of final dimension within finishing cut range. Then on the final cut, I pan across to even out the surface just in case the grind on the end of the grooving tool isn't perfect. To measure that shoulder, I've got a secret weapon that was sent to me by a viewer quite a while back. I've got this little baby Starrett micrometer. This is a 500 thou micrometer, and I don't use it much, but when you've got a really tight space like this, this is just the thing. This thing is absolutely adorable. The anvils on a normal mic are too big to get into a space like that. Now I know the depth of my finish cut there, and I started the groove intentionally too far to the left so that I could bring it in to get the width of the center boss area correct. This width is the most critical dimension on the part, so I want to make sure I nail that. So I translate over with an indicator to face that right hand shoulder to the correct length. Then I go all the way into my finishing cut distance on the diameter of the shoulder, feet across to the other side, and pull out, and we're done. Final inspection, and woof, look at that. Never get tired of seeing zeros. It's every machinist's favorite number. Then I'll part this off a little long, Yahtzee, flip it around, face it down to final length, and drill and tap the hole in the other side. On this end, a depth mic will tell me if I've hit my shoulder depth correctly, so I know when to stop facing off my part there. And that's a handy way to measure that because I don't have to disturb my setup to do it. 
And actually, I overshot that by a thou and a half. And they can't all be zeros, or we'd run out of them. That was center drilled, drilled, and tapped the same way. And of course, I need two of those, so I made two of them. Back over to the assembly now. Let's see how these guys go together. So you can see the role those pins serve. They act as sort of supports and separators in the arms there and hold everything together just behind where the neural wheels go because that's where all the force is going to be. Speaking of neural wheels, we need axles for those. So the kit comes with this precision ground tool steel for the purpose. We just need to add a couple of features to make them into axles. I'm going to start by facing off the end and I'm going to put a center in the end. Now, I didn't love doing this because I actually would prefer not to have a visible center in these parts when I'm done. So I'm putting in the smallest one that I can, just enough to where there's some taper from the center drill there. It has to be more than the pilot point on the center drill because the tapered surface created by the center drill is what's actually supporting the part. So I put in the smallest taper that I could there, and then I'm going to bring in a grooving tool and I'm going to find the end of the part here because we need some grooves in this guy. And at this point, I looked at that grooving tool and realized that thing is a hot mess. I don't know who ground that, but it's terrible. So I took it over to the bench grinder, squared up the end, and put the proper clearances down the sides and underneath. And now I can find the end of the part and translate over to where my groove needs to be. I'm not out of the woods yet, though. I've got a clearance problem with the live center there on the tool post. I don't want to extend that tool bit any further because this is a high tool pressure operation. So instead, I'm going to bring in the old school dead center with some extreme pressure grease on there. And I'll use that instead because that gives me a lot more clearance here. You don't see me use my dead center a lot, but on these small parts in a setup like this, it sure is a lifesaver. Now this is tool steel, so it's going to have very high cutting forces with a grooving tool, which is why I'm using tail support, which is why I put the center in it, even though I kind of didn't want to. Now if the stock is long enough, the way you can get around this is by leaving extra length at the end where the center is and then face it off at the end. Unfortunately, the stock that came in the kit is not long enough to do that in order to get both parts out of it, so I'm just going to have to live with the small center in the ends of these parts. My grooving tool is intentionally narrower than the width of the final groove. I wasn't sure exactly how big it was after I reground it, though, so I measured it again here, and that tells me how much I need to step over to get to the final groove width. Accurately measuring the width of a groove this small can be pretty tricky. The way I decided to do it is because the final dimension is 110 thou, I have a 100 thou gauge block here. So I just edged over with the grooving tool until the 100 thou gauge block was a close fit, and the 110 thou block would not fit. So then I knew I just had to move over another 10 thou, and now the 110 thou block is a good fit, and we're done. You could use intermediate block sizes, of course, if you needed other dimensions or if you wanted to track your progress as you enlarge the groove. So gauge blocks for the win. The stock is long enough here that I can translate over and do the other feature all in one setup, which is always nice when you can do that for, again, concentricity. Although for these features, it really doesn't matter. The crucial thing for concentricity is the outer surface of this part, which is the existing precision ground surface of the stock. These grooves here are just for set screws, so they don't actually have to be very concentric. The crucial detail here, though, is that I'm translating over from left edge to left edge of the groove because that's where the grooving tool ended up. But that's good for me because that means I can nibble my way back towards the right and make sure that that center boss area ends up the exact right width because that width is actually the most critical one on the part. That width is what has the tightest tolerance on this part. The grooves can be a little sloppier. Again, choosing my order of operations here in order to ensure that the most critical dimension is the one that gets the most care. Then of course parring it off long, Yahtzee, and flipping it around and facing it down to length. Now the second part I did a little bit differently because again the stock was so short. You can see I only had a little stub left there that's longer than the part. So once again, much like the previous parts, I had to do this one a different way. I had to do the first groove, then flip it around and do the second groove. I guess the advantage to this is that I didn't need tail support because I didn't have very much stick out but it was a lot fussier to get that center boss to be the exact right width because I had to keep pulling the part out and upsetting my setup. On that second one, measuring the center boss area there, you can see that actually I'm fourth out under there on that one. So you can see how much more difficult it is to nail a dimension when you have to keep pulling the part out to measure and you're having to rebuild your setup over and over. It's an important lesson that when you've got dimensions that are critical, you really want to be able to do them in one setup if at all possible. Doing things in one setup is extremely powerful, both for accuracy and concentricity, and also efficiency. 
There's my two little axles there, and I'll show you how these coordinate with all the other parts we've got so far. Those slide in the ends there, and you can see how the grooves align with those set screw holes that will hold the neural wheels in place. A lot of the parts in this batch were very similar, but I tried to show you a few different ways to do them and different reasons why. Well, that's a pretty impressive looking pile of parts so far, but that's all the time I have this week for this project. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons who make all this content possible, and I'll see you next time.